Sorry, Squatch is Daniel Wilkinson, the Managing Director of the Americas Division, who is also the author of a book, Silence on the Mountain, Stories of Terror, Betrayal, and Forgotten, and Forgetting in Guatemala. Thank you so much. So all of us are very eager to hear your questions and responses to the film. Um, but to get things started, I thought I would ask you each a question. Um, Joey and Sander, can you tell us a bit about sort of how you came to this story and talking, you know, this uh, and gain the access uh, to Claudia Pazzi Paz? Uh, well, Sander and I had been living a few years before starting this project in Guatemala. Uh, Sander is a human rights lawyer, I could say, um, and uh, I, I, I'm a filmmaker, and for those purposes, uh, we live in Guatemala. Sander also is the co-founder of uh, an NGO, and uh, well, I made a film about his project, and in, that was in 2007. Then we, well, we continued living in Guatemala, and we noticed from very nearby. Uh, how the violence had an impact on on every individual in Guatemala, and um, um, so later on we we wanted to do something with that story, also relating to the violence of the past, and figure out in research how uh, the violence of the past was related to the current violence. And during that research, we noticed uh, Claudia Pasipas, and then we thought she should be. Um, the character of, of our film, and that's when we got to meet with her and uh, won her trust to make this documentary. And so clearly, there was a lot at stake. What what did you say, or how did you get her to feel comfortable with this? Well, when we approached her, um, uh, we had some mutual friends, and, and she said, "Well, you can come by in Guatemala and explain what your idea is." So we came by and we got to meet her, and it was first. It was a very tense moment because we had uh, we had read so much about her, and then there she was, a very small, humble woman, surrounded by bodyguards, entering the room, and the two of us nervous. And she said, "Well, boys, tell me what's what's your idea." And then we explained that we wanted to follow her uh, and and see what she could achieve and follow her quest for justice. And she said, well, I've, I have nothing to hide. I'm in favor of a more transparent public prosecutor's office. And if you want to film me, that's, that's fine when you want to start. And that's how we get started, filming her in her office. And gradually, it was a process of getting to know each other and, and getting to trust each other. And for Daniel, um, Human Rights Watch has worked on Guatemala for 30 years. Um, can you tell us a bit about sort of how what Claudia's tenure meant for the country? Uh, sure. First, let me just congratulate the filmmakers. Uh, I think it's a wonderful film, and to get Claudia Pasi Pas to do a film uh, and to make her the hero of the film is is not easy. She really is one of the as as I think the film captured. She's one of the most uh, sort of unassuming, uh, modest, uh, sort of self-effacing personalities, um, as certainly uh, much more so than any prosecutor I've ever met uh, in my many years working on these issues, uh, and, and someone who's played such a heroic uh, historical role in, in this country uh, is, is quite a paradox, uh, and rather beautiful that someone with, with a personality like hers. Um, for people working on human rights in, in Guatemala, her tenure was was really something miraculous. Uh, it, it, it felt it felt like a miracle. And to understand why, you, you need to understand what came before her. And I, I think the film gives you a sense, um, but uh, just what I can add on, if you go back 30 years uh, to when, uh, I guess the early 80s, at the height of the violence during the Civil War, um, the film gave you a sense of just the, the absolute the horror, the, the grotesque, sadistic type of violence uh, as particularly targeting indigenous communities. Um, to, 
to, to just a, a few facts that also help understand the, 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 the impact on the population as a whole, not just the indigenous communities. The Truth Commission uh, that was mentioned in the film, that the, the Bishop Harari, when he presented his, his, um, his report, that was an initial uh, 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 informal Truth Commission. Then there was a UN Truth Commission that estimated that as many as 200,000 people were killed in the country. Now, the vast majority of the killing, more than 90% was done by the army or paramilitaries, you know, groups associated with the army. And the, the other side of the Civil War, there were guerrillas, there were never more than, say, 10,000 combatants. So put those numbers together and you realize the vast majority of victims were civilians. So this was really, you know, they called it a civil war, but really what it was was decades of violence by the state against the civilian population. And the aim of that violence really was terror. It was to terrorize the, the, the population. And, and it worked. Um, so 30 years ago for human rights was a period of, of extreme hopelessness and despair and fear. Skip ahead, you know, 20 years ago, in the 90s, the country was emerging from all that, and it was a moment of, of real hope after decades of, of, of fear and, and, and despair with human rights groups in Guatemala. I should say 30 years ago, it, you would think it would be impossible to do human rights work. Um, and yet you saw in that film, there was a great clip of, of, those, uh, of that woman uh, confronting Mejia Victor. So, so people did do it, they often got killed. But uh, it, it was done in an, an extreme situation. But 10 years later, the war was ending. And these uh, people who had been fighting for justice really started forming uh, organizations, local human rights groups, and pressing for justice. And uh, there was the end of military rule. So it was, a, it was a, you know, the idea was finally there could be truth, and then there could be justice. And the, this murderous military was no longer controlling the country. And uh, this, this enormous uh, uh, potential to, to turn things around. That was late 90s. But then, sort of reality, the post-conflict reality sunk in, and you go back just 10 years ago, again, I think it was a period of real despair uh, because these human rights groups were, were able to function, but it was so hard to move to, to really to get justice. There, there were cases. That they, got, they managed to get a few cases prosecuted, but each one felt like the exception that, would, that proved the rule because witnesses would be murdered and, and, and judges and prosecutors had to flee the country. And, and, and I, the film captured this as well. The military is out of power, but the former military people are now either politicians or they're members of these organized crime groups that were really running the country. So incredible corruption, weak institutions, and again, a climate of fear. Um, and so people were really starting to give up. I think 10 years ago, the sense in the human rights uh, community and, and certainly in the international community, people supporting Guatemala was real, really like it's almost a lost cause. Um, and when Claudia Pasi Pas came in, um, uh, I, I can explain a little bit more later. I've gone on for a bit now, but but how that came about, um, and uh, you know, in, in just a word, it came about because of the efforts of a lot of people. Once she came in, there was this moment where. Um, there was a, uh, she was able to put together a team and really move forward on cases in a way that had never happened before. And, and you got that tally at the end, which was great, when she's going through the tally of the things she accomplished. And it wasn't just about human rights. It's about gang violence, about corruption, uh, organized crime. And I think at the end of her tenure, uh, impunity is still overwhelming in Guatemala. The vast majority of human rights cases and other cases remain unsolved and unprosecuted. But the difference, you know, we often look at situations as a glass half full versus half empty. You know, Guatemala might have gone from a glass pretty much empty to a glass maybe, I don't know, an eighth full, you know? Uh, 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 a little bit more, but that is, it's, it's almost an existential thing. For anyone working on human rights, when you have pretty much almost no hope, and you go to a situation where uh, there are results in enough cases that, that it's not unrealistic to hope for an end result, that just fundamentally changes uh, the dynamic for everyone, justice officials, witnesses, victims, 
and it gives people a, a sense that it's it's worth uh, fighting for these things. So I, I see many faces in here. I hope there are some questions. So feel free to raise your hand, and um, and I'll I'll repeat back some questions because it's a little hard to hear in the back. I think I'll start with you. Uh, well, I'd like to ask you to say something to the audience about the United States' involvement in uh, Guatemala's uh, rapid decline and what what were they doing? I saw her shaking Hillary Clinton's hand. I believe. Uh, what were they doing while Claudia Cazuzaz was doing her work? Yeah. But, but I'm, I'm really thinking back here to, to the beginning. Right. So, Joanne uh, uh, Sander, feel free. The, the question was about um, the U.S. involvement in Guatemala, and certainly Daniel has. The U.S. involvement in Guatemala is a very long history. It was extremely harming back in 1954 with the counter revolution supported by the CIA. It has been extremely harmful under the Reagan administration and their support to the Rios Mont regime. Um, but during Claudia's, the, the tenure of Claudia Paz, I think the United, the United States administration has played a, a positive role. They've always supported Claudia Paz, not only for her success in human rights cases, but, but also because she was one of the few, or maybe the only reliable counterparts within the Guatemalan justice system for the war on drugs that is a high priority for the United States. So combined, I think the United States really pushed in favor of Claudia Paz and the fact that the support of the U.S. Embassy could not prevent her term from being shortened with seven months, could not prevent her not being nominated for a second term. Perhaps also shows the, the, the determination within Claudia's opponents. They were so determined to, to have Claudia Pasipas out that they decided, okay, we're going to withstand all the United States pressure on this issue. We really need to push her out and, and make, make this point. And I think it was, I think the United States did most of, of what it could do. But you have a different opinion. Uh, no, I completely agree with you. Um, I, I think uh, the, 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 he's right. The U.S. pretty much overthrew the Democratic government in 1954 and put in that military dictatorship. It got to probably its worst moment in, in the Reagan years when Reagan met with uh, Rios Montt. Um, and had a, held a press conference with him and praised him as a, um, a champion of democracy and, and dismissed the claims that there were human rights abuses. Uh, right at the moment they were talking, the, the Rios Mons, um, you know, elite troops were marching on a village called Las Dos Aves where they would murder everyone, um, except for the girls and women who they kept alive for a few days so they could rape them and then murdered all of them. Um, and it's a case worth mentioning because that's another case that uh, has been sex successfully prosecuted uh, in, in recent years and under um, the tenure of, of Claudia Pasi Pas. More recently, with the end of the Cold War, the U.S. Did, has played a very supportive role with local human rights groups, uh, with the Truth Commission, financing the Truth Commission, um, helping efforts to set up an uh, international commission. It's one part of the movie that's not there, but maybe this can be your next movie. Uh, there's an in international uh, investigative commission that was set up uh, because local human rights groups 10 years ago, and I was saying that moment of despair, came up with this very novel idea uh, to have an international commission work with local institutions. Uh, it's sort of a hybrid because in the human rights Field, we tend to think of a separation between domestic institutions and courts, and when they don't work, you go to international ones. They come up with an idea of having an international commission that would work to push cases through the domestic institutions. And it was that commission that exposing problems of, of corruption in, within the prosecutor's office and elsewhere that created a political scandal that led a president to do the radical thing of putting this person, Claudia Pasipas, in office. It never would have happened without that commission. And then this commission worked a lot with Claudia Pasipas, 
to, to advance these cases. And they did so a, a lot with the support from, from, from the U.S. government. It's not just the U.S. government, the international community, other European governments have, have been involved in, in supporting uh, as well. As far as CSIG is concerned, uh, they work on two-year mandates, and it was Sorry, renewed. Just to be clear, CSIG is the commission I was just talking about. I don't know if that was clear. Yeah, yeah so they work with two-year mandates, and they got renewed. So they have until September 2017 now, which is a very positive development, because without CSIG, Claudia Paz would not have been appointed, and it was a fundamental source of support for her. So, but, but right now, Guatemala is in political turmoil. Uh, there's massive public protests. The vice president resigned in a corruption scandal. The minister of justice and the interior uh, that you also briefly see in the film, he also resigned. So Guatemala is really in a political crisis at this moment. And the public prosecutor's office as such is not really involved in the political crisis. Uh, it, you, it was the focus of political crisis when Claudia's term was cut short and she was replaced by uh, Talma Aldana, uh, another female attorney general and a former uh, Supreme Court judge. She is, uh, she's, she's the attorney general now, undisputed. Her term, uh, yeah, she, she, she will definitely be the attorney general until elections and Perhaps a new president would replace her, which used to be custom in Guatemala. Actually, every single president, upon assuming office, replaced the attorney general. <laughs> Otto Pérez Molina did not. He, he kept Claudia Paz, Paz under severe pressure, both domestically and internationally. Uh, but, but it's very interesting and, and tense and turbulent times right now in Guatemala, and very uncertain what, what the coming months will bring. Um, let me put a slightly different spin on this, uh, and I'm going to put a hopeful spin on this. Um, you can take it with a grain of salt, uh, because in, in my line of work, uh, you know, what we do, we always have to um, uh, find hope, uh, otherwise we can't go to work the next day. Um, but uh, this, um, when, when Claudia Pasi Pas was, was basically forced out of office a few months early, and uh, you know, what was captured in the film, and then she would just in the most arbitrary manner she was excluded from the short list of people to be appointed uh we were again at a low moment it seemed like uh, you know that this this window of opportunity had closed um and uh, a new attorney general was appointed i don't think people in the human rights movement had high hopes i guess probably feared the worst and then things got even even worse uh towards the end of last year 2014 when it became pretty certain that President uh, Pérez Molina would not renew the, um, the mandate of, of CICIG, of that commission, right? And so it would expire. Uh, and once it expired, uh, with the new Attorney General gone, there basically it, 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 there wouldn't be any opportunity for moving cases forward, and the ones that had moved forward could be overturned, and everything would go backwards. Um, but um, what happened has happened so far this year has been pretty amazing. Uh, there has been first rallying from uh, initially the human rights groups, then the international community, uh, including the U.S. government. Uh, Joe Biden went to went to Guatemala and basically um, it might seem like you know old school. Uh, 
uh, American uh, pushing around the, the, the small country, but in this case for good, uh, really pressing um, Perez Molina to renew the, 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 the mandate of, of Sisig. Uh, but I don't think that's what did it. What did it was that Sisig, uh, it, it did this huge bust of, uh, you know, exposed this organized crime ring involving the office of the vice president and, and uh, arrested uh, the vice president's, you know, people very close to the vice president. Uh, and, and this this couldn't have happened without the attorney general. So the, so this new attorney general was, was as Claudia Pasipas had done before her, was working with this commission and this time going after organized crime and corruption at pretty much the highest level of the Guatemalan government. It was a huge scandal, and it mobilized. The, 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 there had been this debate about whether the president would renew or not, would re renew this commission, and he kept making clear he was not going to, but he was buying time because there was international pressure, and the U.S. was promising hundreds of millions of dollars, but not withhold, and all this was going on, and suddenly the scandal hit, and, and and sectors of Guatemalan society who had never been on, on our side on this issue, including the private sector, uh, spoke out and joined in with the, with the human rights groups, uh, with people who have cared about the rule of law in the past, including the Chamber of Commerce of Guatemala. The private sector, historically very conservative, did like Claudia Pasi Pas, there was a, a, a poll of its members, it's not just the leadership, it's members, 70% of them uh, approved of the renewal of, of, of Sisig after because it was going after the cor these corrupt people, and um, it, it, it so this it was this this uh, this rallying across the political spectrum in favor of Sisig, and because of the scandal, the president Pedro Molina had to do what we all thought he wasn't going to do and renew the commission. But the commission now was renewed. It was almost better that the president had initially been against it because the whole country rallied about it. It's never had more. Uh, legitimacy and political clout. And then these protests are, is, is political turmoil, but what we're seeing now in Guatemala in recent weeks are protests with tens of thousands of people in the street. And this is something new. These, it, these are non-ideological. There are, it's the people really across the political spectrum. In the past, there have been people protesting for justice and they tend to be human rights. And on the left in Guatemala, or that it's been sort of right wing. This is pretty non-ideological. People demanding justice and accountability and rule of law, uh, and that's that's a good thing. So I think I think we're in a, in a pretty hopeful moment. I, I say hope. I'm not going to say I'm. You know, I won't use the word optimistic. The problems are huge, but but the, but there's there's very good reason to hope that um, that the progress that you saw in the movie is going to continue uh, and maybe even accelerate in, in coming months and years. Can I ask actually a question about our hero, Claudia? What, what is she up to right now, Joey? And, and sort of what is her life right now? Um, well, first of all, I think uh, you were correct in saying that Claudia, as a, as a person, she's very humble and she's not very... Um, uh, likely to be in the spotlights, um, and and that's also um, how she is at the moment. She is living in the United States, um, but she doesn't want to be um, in the media too often. Um, but she is working there at the university, and she is doing the an, an, the investigation to the 43 students that were disappeared in Mexico. So. Um, so she's very busy with that, and um, she's living uh, a life with her husband and son in Washington, and she hopes to be able to come back to Guatemala soon, but that will probably be some months yeah. away, yeah. or some years. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, let me see, I haven't gotten to the middle yet. Yeah, there, there, there have been uh, a lot of challenges during the whole process. 
Um, the first challenge was to get the film financed uh, because people in the Netherlands, we are from the Netherlands, they don't know about Guatemala. So um, with just a little money we were able to get five tickets. Uh, but in the end we got, uh, through a crowdfunding campaign uh, organized by our producers, uh, we, we got able to, to, to at least be able to pay the, the people who edited and the film. Um, so that was one of the challenges, but of course safety is a challenge and knowing who to trust and who to work with. Um, so we were always uh, working in a small crew and uh, living with people that we trusted and that were also close to uh, Claudia, lawyers. And um, um, so that's, that's, that's a bit how we, how we got to uh, be able to film. And um, well, another challenge is uh, to distribute the film in, in Guatemala. We have to be careful with that. We don't want to um, uh, have those opponents um, to abuse the film. So together with organizations um, and, and together with Claudia, we are preparing a good premiere in, in Guatemala. And we will probably do that uh, after the, the elections. <coughs> Um, yeah, that, I think that those, but, but uh, the question about how to, how to work with the opponents, actually that was very easy to get access to them. Um, um, the guy who you see in, in the film, um, Sander called him and we were invited to his office and he gladly speaks very openly about all his uh, ideas about Claudia Passi Pass. And actually, he was talking so much that I had to just stop recording because I was out of tape. So I had to select what he was saying. Um, so that's also uh, the freedom that, that, that he and his other well, powerful people have to just speak out. And it's very hard to see how someone like Claudia Pazipas has to shut down while, while saying the truth and that he has so much freedom to express, not only against us, but in the, in the daily media. He also writes for newspapers and he's in radio shows often, as well as, as his um, think likes. Um, it's very hard to see how they get the opportunity to speak so freely, while well, people like Claudio Pass, uh, yeah, it's very hard for them to speak out. Sorry, I'm seeing someone point there. I'm going to go back there and then I'll come back up here. Yeah. Sorry, yes, you. The one that your, your friend was pointing at you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, you. What investigations have been made into how the Lockbird got flipped? What investigations have been made into how the Rio's verdict got flipped? Well, you did an investigation. <laughs> yeah, it's... The, the, what you saw in the film, how the verdict got annulled with in 10 days in, and, and if you look at the reasoning that the Constitutional Court provided uh, for, for the annulment, it's, it's unbelievable. It has very little to do with, with law. You wouldn't recognize it as, a, as legal reasoning. It has to do with, the, with, with an appeal to an appeal to another appeal that was, uh, that was refused and then another appeal to the refusal. And, Somehow they came up with, well, the verdict is a note. And it was a decision by the Constitutional Court, which has five members, and it was a three to two majority decision. And the two uh, dissenting judges uh, published very strong dissenting opinions, saying, uh, well, first of all, the matter uh, that formally gives the reason for annulling the verdict. It's not a matter of constitutional law, it's a matter of criminal procedure, and there's still a regular appeal to this first instance trial open to the defendant. So uh, in, on appeal, the criminal procedure issue can be dealt with, and there's no reason for the constitutional court to be involved at this stage. And the other dissenting opinion was also really strongly saying uh, the, the 
refusal to recognize the right to truth and the right to justice for the victims must weigh much, much heavier than the minor issue of criminal procedure that the majority judges apparently uh, observed. So it was a very tense uh, decision. It was uh, severely criticized internationally by the United Nations, by the United States, by the European Union, by domestic human rights groups. But it's, it's, it's a constitutional court decision to which there is no appeal. The problem is before in the nomination procedure for constitutional court justices. And, and, and that nomination procedure is so untransparent and corrupt that people can get appointed into the constitutional court that subsequently give these decisions. And well, the, the, the verdict was annulled, so it had to go back to trial. Uh, it was uncertain, maybe it even had to go back to pre-trial and it got into the usual legal limbo that appeared to be resolved in January, and there was one trial day, and then the defendant, the Gersmont, claimed to be too ill to stand trial. And it's still in this legal limbo where uh, the defense lawyers are filing appeals against every single thing they can think of. They're also calling upon the judges to apply an amnesty law. Uh, and in the meantime, also insisting that the defendant is uh, unfit to stand trial physically. So it's, it's a complete legal limbo, and, and the most uh, probable thing, I think, will be that the, the defense lawyers will succeed in obstructing the trial until the defendant dies or is really unfit to stand trial. He's 85 or 86 years old right now. And the decision to annul the verdict and the initial conviction, it's, it's just a, a legal given at this point where it's really difficult to, to do anything against it. Can I, can I say something on that? I won't give the, the details. I was great. You're a, a lawyer, too, in addition to being a filmmaker. I'm glad you answered that. But the uh, two, two just details. There is a trial date set to start in a few weeks, and it's very likely we'll get a delay. One of the, 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 the main defense lawyer of uh, Rosemont was murdered a week or two ago. I'm not sure what that was about. Um, and I would just stress that it, it's, it is very likely that it'll be dragged out, and um, uh, as you said. Um, but again, a, a positive spin here. Um, what, the setback can't erase that, what you saw, the moment of conviction uh, the, and, and the whole process of the trial. Um, so uh, it is a it is pretty outrageous what happened since, and uh, people you know working to make sure to, to try to make a prosecution happen, but but that cases like that in, in a place like Guatemala sort of have a ratcheting effect. The the, the movement for the, the day the country heard that conviction, I don't think can ever be uh, taken away. That's something that 20, 30 years ago, no one, I think, uh, imagined uh, would happen, uh, and it did. Uh, first, I want to congratulate the filmmaker for doing something so difficult. The horror of the testimony of the indigenous people about what happened to them was as shocking as anything I've seen in the film. And balancing that with the humanity of this prosecutor allowed me to be able to stay in the movie. So that is a huge documentary success, and I want you to know that from this person. My question is about the church, the bishop, uh, the Vatican, and liberation theology, because he was called a Marxist long after they kicked all the liberation theology people out. So who was this bishop? And what is the class? Are they all Catholic, the indig indigenous people, uh, the upper class who supported, one assumes, getting rid of, of, the, of the prosecutor? Could you talk a little bit about that aspect of Guatemala? So, so the question was sort of the, who is the bishop and sort of his relationship to the church and how sort of Christianity plays in. And has the, the new pope 
taken any intervention. Has the new pope taken any intervention? As far as, as, as the Catholic uh, religion is concerned in Guatemala, it used to be very dominant. But in those months, he was not a Catholic. For, or he used to be a Catholic, but he was a born-again Christian I mean, and Jericho. came back as a preacher. He preached on television prior to becoming president through a, a coup d'etat. And he continued preaching while uh, president. And during his regime, Catholics were severely persecuted and many people uh, converted uh, to, to evangelical churches. So that changed the religious outlook of the country. And Bishop Gerardi was an extremely brave individual uh, that, that, that got supported by and large. And, 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 and of course you can, you can see it in terms of, of his relation to the Vatican and in relation to, to the whole church. But I, I think the most interesting perspective is to see Bishop Gerardi as an individual being confronted with severe human rights violations and, and injustice. And, and fighting for his beliefs. And he thought that being a bishop gave him a sense of protection, that people would not kill a bishop. And unfortunately, they did. And as far as the current pope is concerned, what he recently did, perhaps you've seen uh, Bishop Romero in El Salvador. He was very much like Bishop Gerardi in Guatemala, only 15 to 17 years earlier. He was a, a liberation theology bishop, archbishop of El Salvador, uh, exposing the crimes of the regime and of the death escaders or squadrons of El Salvador. He was murdered and he was uh, declared a saint uh, two weeks ago. And I think it would be just and, 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 and the right thing for the, for, for the Vatican to also consider declaring Bishop Gerardi a saint. And of course, uh, Bishop Gerardi's murder occurred 15 years after Bishop Romero's, but I hope he can follow in those footsteps. Thank you. So just a final question is, what is next for, for you, the filmmakers, as well as um, for the film? And where can people see it, etc.? cetera? <coughs> uh, well, our... Um, there, there will be screenings coming up in Latin America. That, that's, that's our uh, next step. Uh, we started the festival tour in Europe and, and in the United States, and now we're here in New York. And it will be shown in uh, Buenos Aires and next week, and also in Lima and Bogota film festivals. Um, for the United States, um, yeah, we, we, we will do a DVD release after the, the festival uh, season has ended. Um, so we just hope um, that, you are, that you will follow us on Twitter and Facebook and our uh, website, burdenofpeace.com. Our Facebook is facebook.com slash burdenofpeace. Uh, so you'll, you'll find us uh, if, if, if you search us uh, online. And, um, also, um, not only to promote our film, but mainly also um, to help support um, Claudia Pazipas and the people um, uh, struggling for justice in Guatemala. Because we hope that with this film and the movie, um, she will not be forgotten. And, and that maybe the, the case against Rios Mont, um, we hope that it will be reopened and it will be successful, and if not, that there will be other cases um, um, opened against other uh, perpetrators during the genocide. Well, thank you so much to each of you and to Daniel for all of your commitment to Guatemala, but also for sharing these beautiful and important stories with this audience. So thank you so much, and thanks to you.